Fairness is a huge and very important topic in mediation, and it might be helpful to distinguish three different kinds of fairness issues that we deal with uh, when we're serving as mediators. So the first fairness issue is, is the process fair? Do the parties feel like they each have an opportunity to talk? Second issue is substantive fairness. Does the solution the parties have come up with in the mediation compare favorably to their alternative to a negotiated agreement, namely uh, court proceedings. The third has to do with a more internalized sense of fairness. And uh, sometimes people feel that even an objectively fair, substantive, uh, substantively fair outcome and a fair process, they still feel aggrieved. So I want to talk about each of those three, if I might. Okay. So the first one, the procedural fairness, I'll um, tell you a quick uh, story. And it was about a, a divorce case uh, where uh, the husband was viewed by the wife as being very domineering. And she really couldn't be in the same uh, room with him. And so what we did was we had shuttle diplomacy. And I went from one room to the other. Uh, that worked because then she felt she could speak freely. And he, when I met with him, uh, sometimes he would be very angry, he would be very stormy, but it didn't cause her to feel like she was, uh, the, uh, she was being over, overpowered by his, his uh, anger and his intensity. Um, and we reached a settlement in that case. The second kind of fairness, the substantive fairness, uh, the, the story that comes to mind uh, has to do with an employment case. An employee got fired and asserted that there were discriminatory reasons for the, ter the job termination. And the employee had a lawyer who was not very experienced. And the company had a lawyer who was very experienced. And ultimately, the case settled for what seemed to me to be a rather modest amount of money. The, uh, plaintiff, the employee, was going to get a payment of $40,000. I believed that with another lawyer, uh, he might be able to get a better settlement. But then again, maybe not. Maybe the employer was only willing to pay $40,000. And so I was faced with a very difficult uh, issue in that case as to whether I should say something about whether this, the settlement was truly adequate. Uh, and I did. I, I talked to the plaintiff. I talked to the plaintiff's lawyer. I said, tell me about why you're willing to settle for $40,000. They told me all the reasons why they thought their case you know, had, some, had some problems, some challenges, and the fact that this gentleman needed the money right away. So that was an important factor. And I think whenever a mediator is faced with that question of, is this agreement substantively fair, uh, it's important for us to ask questions. And that's one of the advantages of meeting with people separately is I could have that conversation as a private, confidential uh, conversation. Now, let me get to the third kind of fairness. This is where the deal, objectively speaking, looks fair, but one party still feels upset. And again, I'll go back to the divorce setting. Uh, I mediated a divorce in which the husband wanted out of the marriage. Uh, he had gotten involved with uh, somebody else, and the wife was really upset. She didn't want the marriage to end. Uh, she was upset that um, he was with someone else. And he agreed not only to divide the assets 50-50, mm -hmm. 
but essentially to divide the income 50-50, which is a better deal than typically occurs uh, in the courts, where the higher earner usually gets a higher percentage of the collective uh, income. Uh, but, you know, he felt like it was his initiative to get the divorce, and he should bend over backwards to try to make things right. And the wife was having a really hard time saying yes to this deal. Now, she had been told by lawyers, she had been told by everybody, this is a better deal than what you can get in court. And still, she was saying to me, I'm uncomfortable signing this deal because it doesn't feel fair. Mm -hmm. So I said, tell me about this. You know, you're getting half the assets, you're getting half the income. Why is it unfair? And she said, well, you know, I've raised the kids. They're going off to school. And, you know, he's got a great career. You know, he's uh, got a, uh, a, you know, real future in his field. And I said, yes, but you're getting half the income from his work. No, but what do, I feel like I'm left with, you know, very little in comparison to what he has. Mm -hmm. And so, in other words, she felt diminished mm -hmm. by the fact that she had devoted her time to raising the kids, taking care of the house, and so forth, and didn't have, have a career. Um, so we talked about it. We talked about those feelings. And I said, so what are your alternatives? You, you don't want this deal. It doesn't feel fair. And she said, uh, well... I think I just need to express these thoughts, these feelings, uh, in a setting like mediation where there's a referee present. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, let's do that. We brought the two parties together and got her to say to him what was on her mind. And then I turned to him and I said, I wonder if you can restate in your own words what you heard her say and then ask her if you got it right. And so we got involved in this very really touching and personal kind of conversation where they really communicated with each other. And ultimately, they made the, the deal work. But that's one of the things that's great about mediation. When these issues of fairness come up, it creates an opportunity to have a conversation that you can't have in court. So this is a very good question. Uh, one of the hallmarks of mediation is when the parties reach an agreement, they're giving informed consent to the agreement. What does that mean? Well, it means getting advice about what your alternatives are to this negotiated agreement. Now, where are you going to get that advice? You get it primarily in our legal system, get it from the lawyers. Uh, other kinds of disputes, uh, there might be other expertise you want to uh, bring into the conversation. But my role as a mediator is to make sure that the parties have the advice they want and need in order to give informed consent. And I will help them find lawyers. I will give them lists of lawyers, give them uh, websites where they can find rosters of lawyers. The bar associations have lawyer referral services. Uh, and sometimes the parties say, no, no, we don't want to talk to lawyers. We chose mediation because we don't want to get lawyers involved. I said, okay, I understand that. Let's see if we can reach an agreement. And before you sign the agreement, consult with a lawyer. Let the lawyer look at the agreement. And uh, I've often found the lawyers add a lot of value. They find some gaps or ambiguities or ways the agreement can be more precise. Um, and they give the parties the confidence they can sign the agreement and not worry they're going to look back in five years or ten years and regret their decision. Um, the, uh, the lists that I provide are online website rosters where they can look at the qualifications. And the uh, two lists that I use a lot are the Massachusetts uh, Collaborative Law Council and the Massachusetts Council on Family Medi Mediation. And both of those rosters you can search geographically. They can find someone who's, who's nearby. And what I always say is, please interview the lawyer. Interview two or three and see uh, uh, who you're comfortable with. Both the mediator and the lawyer have a duty to, to disclose any prior dealings. So I often uh, will provide names of uh, lawyers who are people who support mediation. Indeed, people 
that I've used as mediators. And so we disclose any past cases. We don't provide confidential information or the names of the parties. But we can provide the names of lawyers that we've been involved with, and uh, the parties can do their due diligence uh, that way. So, uh, for example, if someone says, well, we're interviewing you as a possible mediator, mm -hmm. who can we talk to that's worked with you? I cannot give them the names of the parties because that's confidential. Mm -hmm. I can give them the names of lawyers mm -hmm. who've had cases uh, come to my office. Mm -hmm. So I, in answering your uh, question, I want to distinguish between two different things that mediators sometimes do uh, when there's uh, an impasse or they seem the parties seem to be approaching a, a point of impasse. One is called a mediator's proposal, which you just uh, talked about, and the other is case evaluation. Uh, mediators tend to shy away from case evaluation, where we're making a prediction of what a court will do. I am sometimes asked to do it, and in an appropriate case, I, I will do it. Uh, I found it's helpful. Uh, but the risk is that if you say, well, here's what I think a court will do, it may impair your ability to help the parties navigate toward an agreement. Mm -hmm. um, mediator's proposal is different. What I'm doing when I'm making a mediator's proposal is I'm trying to figure out, is there a point where there's the maximum opportunity for settlement? Mm -hmm. It's not a prediction of what a court will do. It's a prediction of what the parties are willing to do. And based on my confidential conversations with them, I will put out a number, same number, in both rooms. Mm -hmm. The parties are sitting in separate rooms, and I ask them to think about my proposal. I tell them I don't have any ego attachment to this proposal. If you reject it, that's fine. My feelings will not be here. Mm -hmm. This is simply a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. And the hypothetical question for each party is, if the other side is willing to accept this proposal, mm -hmm. would you accept it, and vice versa? Yeah. And I will hear their answers confidentially. Mm -hmm. I will not communicate their answers. If I have two yeses, let's say I propose $80,000 as the settlement, and one side says yes, and the other side says no, I'm just going to report there's no settlement. Mm -hmm. If both sides say yes, I'll say you've got an agreement. Mm -hmm. Now the advantage of this meter's proposal is that it gives each side the courage to take a risk. Mm -hmm. The risk of saying yes to a number that maybe isn't their number. It's not the number they want, but it's a number they can live with. It gives them the courage to say yes because the other side won't know mm -hmm. they've said yes unless they too have said yes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, very often toward the end of a case, not the beginning, but toward the end of a case, and the parties are getting close, they will ask the mediator to provide a mediator's proposal. It sounds like your question is, prior to communicating that, the other party says, by the way, right. if you can get uh, as much as 60000 yeah. for us, we're good. Yes. So now the mediator is faced with uh -huh. an ethical dilemma yeah. Yeah. of whether to say, well, you're in luck because the other side is Just willing to pay $60,000. Yeah. Um, or should the mediator say, well, you're in luck because they've offered $80,000. Right. Mm -hmm. So you really have to go back to the ground rules, right? Mm -hmm. So has the party who said $80,000 asked you to uh, keep that in confidence or they asked you to communicate it? Ask you to communicate, then you do communicate it. Um, a party who is saying uh, we're willing to settle for sixty thousand, are they telling you that in confidence, or are they asking you, you know, to to communicate it? Um, in my how many years now? I guess it's been twenty three years of mediating. Uh, I can think of only two times when there's been overlapping settlement authority. And in both instances, what I did was I brought the parties together. And I said, I have some uh, good news for you. I've talked with each of you separately. Uh, and uh, there is a, a range where, uh, based on what you've told me, you can settle this case. 
Now, I wonder if we could have a conversation uh, about this. And in both instances, they were willing to talk about where they wanted to be, what they were willing to do. And usually they wind up at the midpoint between those, those two numbers. Thank you.